in this morning, um, and uh, we're going to have a uh, quick whip around the Ottoman Empire, or more specifically, the demise of the Ottoman Empire. Perhaps I should have called, called this lecture a decade of chaos rather than just uh, turmoil. Um, just a quick um, ad there for the Guild of Battlefield Guides, which I'm a member of, and there are several other members um, in the audience here, including Ron Lyons. Um, but I can tell you there's no guiding going on in uh, Northern Europe at the moment. I'm corresponding with some of my French colleagues during the week, and things are grim. Okay, what are we going to talk about today? Um, the shrinking Ottoman Empire, regime change, the three pashas, some strategic objectives, um, the Ottoman army, because the whole of the Ottoman Empire is actually linked to the fate of the Ottoman army. Um, some campaigns and expeditionary forces that uh, occurred during World War I. Uh, the Navy, the Air Force, and the employment of women. Um, victories in World War I, propaganda, and the legacy for modern Turkey. So if you keep your questions to the end, we've got uh, quite a bit of chaos to get through here. And, um, I'll, uh, I'll push on. Okay, which is the correct word, Ottoman or Turkish? All right, strictly speaking, in the area, era that we're talking about now, we should be talking about Ottomans, although the word, you know, trying to get rid of the word Turk, Turkish, um, is almost impossible at the moment. So what was the Ottoman Empire? Um, it was ruled, an empire ruled by a sultan which uh, had existed for more than 600 years and uh, was spread across three continents. The particular sultan that we'll be talking about this morning uh, was Mehmet Russia V, who uh, was, came to power, he was actually put into power in 1909, and we'll see how in a minute. Unfortunately, they were known as the sick man of Europe because, to be brutally honest, the empire had been falling apart for almost 200 years for various reasons. We'll have a look at some of that. Uh, and as I said, the words Turk and Turkish are used almost uh, used interchangeably. All right, there we go. A Muslim state ruled by a hereditary emperor who was both the sultan, that is the head of state, and the caliph, the head of the uh, Muslim religion. Now, and this is why the word Turk is not quite correct, right? There are many ethnic and religious groupings in that empire, and there's some of them there. Um, and I put the word Anatolian in there because the, the piece of the earth known as Anatolia is now modern Turkey. We'll look at that later. So up there's a list of uh, various peoples who were part of the empire um, leading up to the First World War. Okay. Now, oh, just a very quick one. You see this uniform here, I put this in deliberately. Those of you who studied the Gallipoli campaign know uh, the story of German officers' trench, where they thought they saw German officers in the front line. That's not true. They were imperial, what we would call imperial reservists who'd been called up into the Ottoman army wearing their dark blue uniform. Okay, so that's where that legend came from. Just a quick aside for you. Right, Mehmet. Okay, so he was um, put into power in April 1909 and he died in July 1918. Um, he was largely a figurehead, as I put there. The young Turks, the people who took over the uh, Ottoman government, put him there and told him to sit back quietly, don't leave either of your two magnificent palaces and do what we tell you. Okay, um, so the two, uh, has anybody here been to Istanbul or I'll call it Constantinople? Yeah, okay, so if you've been to Topkapi Palace, you know how um, wonderful it is there. Um, he had five wives and two children. So his main, uh, main activity during the First World War, at least, was to declare a jihad against uh, the Allies. Um, and we'll have a look at the General Field Marshal bit a bit later. Okay, this slide here shows 
in essence, um, the alliance between Germany, Austria, Hungary, and um, the Empire, the Ottoman Empire, which of course stretched further down. Um, but that map there gives a good broad aspect of who was aligned um, up to the time of World War I. This map here shows what the empire looked like in 1912. Now that was the countries that were actually part of the empire, were still part of the empire. But don't forget, any country that was on the borders of that green area there was also influenced um, by, by the Ottomans. Okay, just a quick bit of um, background of language. Now, these uh, are called honorifics or uh, courtesies. Courtesy, and, and they have to do with rank or position. The closest thing we would have in English, and we don't use it here in Australia, would be calling somebody or addressing somebody as Esquire. So, mm -hmm. you know, David Wilson Esquire, which is an honorific on the end of the name. Um, and it applies to both military and civilian ranks and appointments. Offendi uh, is for subaltern officer and ranks. And actually the word Offendi means um, a learned one, someone who can read and write. That's what the, so in military terms, uh, Offendi is for junior officers. Bay, which I will be using, um, is for field officer ranks, major, lieutenant, colonel, or colonel. And Pasha, Pasha, Pashas will become very important as you will see. Um, and we should not be talking about Mustafa Kemal as Ataturk until the period after 1934. So the appellation Ataturk, or father of the Turks, was not applied to him until 1934 and onwards. Um, and Ziki Bey, who I mentioned there, was the officer who assisted Charles Bean when he went back to um, uh, Gallipoli for his mission in 1919. So, um, regime change. And this is where the term Young Turks, which we still use today. In 1908, um, the, a group of, to summarise it very briefly, a group of young army officers, or youngish army officers, decided that they would take over the government, the Ottoman government, um, which had previously had a form of parliament, um, which had, in 1870 had been suspended by the then uh, Sultan. So they, they wanted more say in the ruling of the country and the empire. And it was a, a very mixed group, as I put there, nationalists, pro-Westerners, or anyone who blamed the Sultan Hammond II for the collapse of the empire. So, you know, um, politics makes, makes strange bedfellows. Um, and uh, so they tried this on in 1908, the Young Turks, but uh, there was a counter coup for people who wanted to go back to uh, having the Sultan as the single man in charge, um, uh, Islamists and monarchists. And there was a, a counter coup which occurred on the 31st of March, 1909. Um, and this is where Hamid the second, that particular sultan, was chucked out and Mehmet, his cousin, was installed and told, go and sit in your palace and do what we tell you. So the, uh, this political grouping was called the uh, Committee of Union and Progress, or the CUP, and it had very, very strong uh, military backing, but not exclusively. Okay, now, Middle Eastern politics, always volatile. In 1913, January, there was a, another coup d'etat, and um, the military grouping known as the CUP had fallen out of favour with the, the parliament as it was then. Um, and there was also uh, a lot of pressure to hand back territory and cities that had been um, lost in, uh, in the Balkan Wars. Now, the CUP decided, well, we're not going to put up with this. So they literally kicked down the doors of the cabinet meeting 
Um, they assassinated the Minister of War, or the Defence Minister, and they picked up the Grand Vizier, or the Prime Minister, and hurled him into the street. They physically hurled him into the street. I know I shouldn't be giving you people ideas, but this is how it happened. They kicked down the doors. Um, the loss of Nasim Pasha was a great one. Great loss. Uh, in, he had been the Chief of the General Staff during, of the Ottoman Army during the uh, Falkland Wars. So he was a very experienced man, but um, they didn't like his politics, so they shot him. Um, and in order to carry forward their uh, reform agendas, uh, they installed the three Pashas. And they ruled the empire until its collapse in late 1918. And uh, I'm going to look at all of them, but Enver Pasha was probably the most, the most important one. Now, before we look at the three Pashas themselves, let's have a quick look at what happened between 1911 and 1913. Involved in a number of wars. The empire was sort of constantly at war. Um, this is called the Italo Turkish War, 1911 12, and it was in uh, North Africa and it involved the province of Tripolitania, or now called Libya. And what I'll show you, I'm going to cover several of these, and what I want you to, uh, to look at in particular are the, the numbers of casualties. The enormous casualties, you can see these casualties building up. So the Ottomans lost 8,000 men killed in action against the, uh, against the Italians, and then 10,000 locals were put to death because of, they were signing the Ottomans, executed in reprisals. So the first Balkan War occurred between October 12 and July 13, um, where Bulgaria, Serbia, Greece, and Montenegro um, attacked Ottoman forces that were in occupation in order to uh, declare their own independence. This is a pretty nasty sort of war. And the Ottoman casualties there, uh, total killed, wounded, prisoners of war, and died of disease, was 340,000. Enormous. And those countries in that Balkan League um, decided that they didn't want to have anything more to do with the empire. So uh, I haven't put anybody else's casualties in there, but just to show you how it's building up. And then the Second Balkan War, which was uh, only a few months long in 1913, the Bulgarians, always stroppy, decided that they wanted more land, more, more cities um, from the breakup of the empire. And the Ottomans intervened to try and recapture it. And they, that cost them 4,000 men. Now, let's have a look at the three Pashas who took over and uh, there were three of those, uh, Ismail, Enver Pasha, Ahmed, Jamal Pasha, and Mehmet Talat Pasha. So here we have Enver, and he was the Minister for War and probably the de facto head of the, the three Pashas. Um, and he was a key member of the CUP and a key member of the uh, revolution, the Young Turk Revolution in 1900. Eight. Um, he had postings in Germany, he was very pro-German um, and he was largely the driving force that ensured that the Ottomans joined the, um, the Central Powers, that's Germany, Austria, Hungary, uh, in 1914. He was not a particularly good field commander. And here you are, here's a clue, if you want to be a general, marry the Sultan's daughter. Right, this is where we went wrong, mate. <laughs> <laughs> um, he loved medals and uniforms. He was ambitious, vain, and arrogant. And there's a good uh, rendering of him with uh, lots of uh, good medals and decorations. <clears throat> um, so he was he was the boss, cocky. Jamal Pasha, okay, um, and he commenced his military service in 1893. Again, he was a CUP member, but he favoured an alliance with the French. So not all Ottoman officers were pro-German. And a lot of Ottoman officers favoured neutrality. They didn't want to go to anybody's side. So this is important to note in the background. 
And he was the military commander of Constantinople, so he'd be a pasha, okay? That's, so regardless of his military rank, if he was the, uh, the mayor of Constantinople of Istanbul, he'd be a pasha in the rank, rankings. Um, and he uh, also led the big attack on the Suez Canal and put down Arab revolts. Again, he was not a successful commander. A lot of these guys left in the power, but were not particularly brilliant in the field. Promoted or promoted themselves beyond their capabilities. And here's the third Pasha, Talat, Talat Pasha. Okay, uh, now he was a civilian um, and a member of the committee, so he was a high ranking CEO member, Minister of Finance in the Interior. And this, in his role as the Interior Minister, um, he was, he became the Prime Minister, and he was the guy who made a statement that I am going to get the Armenians. Right? He was the guy who organised the pogrom against the Armenians and also the Greeks and some Greeks and Syrians. So if you want, um, uh, you want somebody who is basically evil, then He's the man because he, he plotted those uh, ethnic cleansing operations. All right, so here's, a, here's a, another map that shows the, uh, the central powers. Uh, again, just to refresh, we've got the Western Front, the Eastern Front, the Caucasus up here on the edge of the Black Sea, the Dardanelles, and down in that bottom left hand corner, stretching away into the Middle East to refresh your memories. Now, as I said, not everybody agreed with siding with the Germans and Austro-Hungarians. Um, but what were their, object their stated objectives? Um, regain and retain bits and pieces of the empire? Um, definitely regain ground territory in the Balkans. Uh, there was a mad scheme to construct the, construct the Berlin to Baghdad Railway uh, for resupply um, in exchange for oil products which would come out of the Middle East. Uh, again, uh, Suez Canal features to control the trade routes. Okay, if they could do that. Um, and of course, German, one of Germany's principal aims during the First World War was economic expansionism. And so they wanted to hang, in, hang on to the coattails of that. Now, what was, well, there were, there were a number of factors, but what was a very, very big primary motivating factor for the Ottomans joining the Central Powers? It was fear of Russia. Fear of Russia. This was this was probably the thing that tipped them towards the Central Powers. Um, and this cartoon is on the cover of a magazine called Puck, and it dates from about 1909, 1910. And each of those cards is a country. And there's um, there's Syria, a bit hard to read, etc. France, etc. etc. So. Uh, the, the Russians, this is depicting the fact that people in some of those countries believed that um, the Russian bear was going to knock down the house of cards and take over. Alright, so we had a look at some of the uh, conflicts that the Ottoman Empire was involved in before World War I. Um, what were the main campaigns for World War I? Um, and I won't cover all of these, uh, but Caucasus, the Chernobyl campaign, or what we call the Gallipoli campaign, Mesopotamia, Palestine. And they also sent um, expeditionary forces to Galicia, uh, Bulgaria, and the Arabian Peninsula. So uh, there's a um, regimental flag, the black and white one, and that's the Ottoman army battle flag which date was for 600 years old, so it's not specifically associated with World War I. It was a 600 year old battle flag. All right, let's have a look at the Ottoman soldier. 
Um, certainly the general staff were surprised by the sudden war option, as I said, mentioned briefly. Many, many Ottoman officers preferred neutrality. They believed, that group believed, that they were not ready for the First World War. And I showed you some of the casualty figures for the Balkan War and the Libyan War. Within the army itself, their senior officers were very, very well trained. They did staff college and senior staff college courses in many other European countries, including France and Germany and Austria. Okay? So they were well experienced from the staff level. Um, casualties in the Balkan War and in um, Northern Libya um, meant that they were, they were short of junior officers. And uh, as I mentioned, with the uh, Imperial Reservists in their blue uniforms, they needed to uh, activate their reserves to bring themselves up to war strength. And there's a couple of, there's a few photos, vast array of uh, uniforms there. Uh, the white tropical uniform and the uh, mainly khaki uniform there. Um, and various bits of head gear. We'll move on. All right. So the foot soldier, the Asker, or Mehmet, is his nickname. I'll just have a look at uh, how the Ottoman army was, uh, was brought up to strength. So it was com conscription was compulsory for Muslim citizens for three years from age 20 up to age 45. So you didn't have to go in at age 20. You could do your military service any time in that age group. Um, the Aki Force, the Zamiye, the Reserve Force, the Redif, and the Territorial Force, and the Staff Force. Um, so, probably around a million men and 210,000 animals available, but only under arms in 1914, right, so only under arms, about 200,000 men, about two a quarter of a million people. And so that was the numbers that they needed to activate from their reserves uh, to bring themselves up to war strength at short notice. Um, so, but the Balkan Wars had caused a lot of casualties in junior officers and NCOs. Um, there we are there. Long-suffering soul used to operating in privation um, with minimal logistic support. Okay, and there are uh, there's a list of uh, the areas that they served in. Um, these two photos, the one over there um, on your right, shows uh, them wearing Arab headdress, kafia, I think it's called. And uh, this is a tropical uniform. This is a standard um, brown uniform. Uh, this is called the Cadillac which was in fact invented by Enver. Um, and red fez. Now, uh, you see pictures of that, but I don't think there are too many red fezes in the front line trenches of Gallipoli. <laughs> Attract the wrong sort of attention to yourself. It's more, more of a uh, barracks uniform and a piece of kit. Um, quick look at their infantry weapons. There's the Mauser rifle in 1903. Um, I've got one of these at home in my collection, but I didn't think it was a good idea to bring it in on the train. It's got the uh, Sultan Cipher on the on the Knox form up here, um, and I've got some and Turkish ammunition as well. And then there's the broom handle pistol, favoured by officers. <coughs> Um, now, cavalry. Um, at the risk of offending people who love the Australian light horse, um, the Ottoman cavalry was very, very good. It had been offer, uh, operating for a number of centuries and was highly efficient um, and was a worthy opponent in the Middle East against the light horse and the New Zealand and the rifles. They also had uh, camel regiments like we did. And there's a uh, <coughs> there's a, a Turkish cavalry regiment on parade there. Field artillery, various kinds of um, 
uh, field guns, including pack how howitzers, mainly in 75, 76 or 77 calibre. Um, German Krupp was a favourite, and also others that they had captured during the Balkan Wars. And uh, there were 24 of these guns per division. Um, they also had the, uh, this very strange, um, I'm not sure if I have a picture here, it's a um, four barrel cannon type thing, uh, the Norden Felt. There were uh, a couple of batteries of these at Gallipoli. And um, the core artillery was uh, 105 howitzers. Some pictures there. Garrison artillery. Um, these were 120 millimetre guns. Average. There were a, a variety of guns of various calibres um, along with Dardanelles, some of which ran out of ammunition because they were so old. Uh, and <coughs> there's a, pictures of uh, those big coastal guns, some of which are uh, still in, the, in position, particularly on the, uh, at the fort above from Sedalana in Gallipoli. Okay, uh, they did have specialist troops, apart from the ones I've previously mentioned. Engineers included railway troops, signalers, and air corps. I'll have a look at them in a minute. Um, logistics, ox carts, pack mules and donkeys, that was the, that was the way they moved their, uh, their logistics forward. Um, the clerical corps was a big part of the Ottoman army. The whole empire was run by clerks. Um, you, know, you watch t TV programs like Yes Minister, how the public service manipulated all the uh, all the ministers, etc. This is how they, this is how the Ottoman Empire was run. And uh, young officers from writing home from Gallipoli saying, "I spent several hours last night filling out forms." Now, down to how many rounds did my men fire during the day. Uh, machine gunners were very important. Uh, there were four machine guns at regimental level. And I will, as an aside here, um, bring to your attention this myth that hundreds of our boys who landed at Anzac in the dark at 4.30 in the morning were mown down by Turkish machine gunners. This is complete and utter crap. Okay, it's the nicest word I'll use about it. If you want to read a good book about the landing at Anzac, um, Chris Roberts, our friend Chris Roberts, um, landing at Anzac covers all that. Machine guns were controlled at regimental level, not at company or battalion level. Okay, and um, there was a lot of work being done by Professor Harvey Broadbeck, um, looking at the Ottoman records. And if you want to know what's truth and what's fiction, then I strongly recommend this book to you. Okay, also uh, ski trips in the Atlas Mountains, um, all kitted out there, a single ski and a single ski pole. And they also had the medical corps. Now, let's have a look at a couple of these side issues. The Caucasus campaign. So, the politicians, or the Young Turks or the CUP, depending on who you want to point the finger at, um, entered into a secret treaty on the 2nd of August 1914 with Germany and Austria-Hungary. Um, and obviously uh, the Turkish and Ottoman general staff found out, hmm, goodness me, nobody told us. Um, and the key issue there, or one of the key issues was uh, the war against the Russians. They were petrified about the Russians taking Ottoman territory. And so this Caucasus campaign was designed so that the Ottoman army could recapture um, Armenian territory which bordered on Russia. And this is the, this is the area. So this started in 1914 and went through to early 1918, and the orange area, uh, which is just under the corner of the Black Sea there, um, the orange area was the area captured by the Russians in a fairly vicious and um, 
failed, failed with that campaign. So there it is there, recapture land that lost to the Russia, 1877, 78. Now the Armenians allied themselves with Russia, <coughs> 7,000 men. The other thing that the Armenians did was that in 1908, Enver Pasha decided that all people inside the empire who were non-Muslims, so Armenian Christians, Greek Orthodox Christians, Syrian Christians, Jews, had to perform national service. And this caused a big problem, a really big problem. And this is one of the reasons why um, Tala wanted that they backed, that there was a lot of pushback against that. That's why Tala decided, I'm going to get the Armenians. They're not on our side. Um, so the, there were two, yeah, two large armies um, at various times in the Caucasus, and Mustafa Kemal, who would have been Pasha, was uh, a commander for a, a brief time of the Ottoman Second Army. So it would have been Mustafa Kemal Pasha at that time. Um, then there was another army that they formed to add on, and. Um, so there were 309,000 men throughout that campaign and 3,000 German advisors. Now here's the casualties. As I said, I, I want to emphasize this during this period. You know, 576,000 casualties across that rather long campaign. How long can you maintain that? Um, we'll have a little bit of a, a look at the um, uh, Chernakali campaign and the Ottoman army, the particular Ottoman army was uh, the 5th army in, formed in March 1915 to defend the peninsula and as Ron mentioned in his uh, lecture a few weeks ago the Ottomans kicked all the Greeks who had settled on the Gallipoli peninsula so two months before this happened um, the Ottomans tried to relocate all the Greeks in another pogrom. Um, <clears throat> so the Fifth Army is about 84,000 men, um, but the numbers that I found, two thirds of those men, two thirds of that 84,000 were veterans, battle hardened veterans of the Balkan Wars. And this is a key factor when you are looking at the Gallipoli campaign, particularly the land actions. So, three corps, which we'll look at in a bit of detail, was commanded by Esart Pasha on the peninsula, and a German, Colonel Hans Kannengeiser, um, commanded the corps of two divisions on the southern side of the Dardanelles. And then, of course, you had all the heavy artillery that was in the forts up and down um, the, uh, the Dardanelles themselves, plus, plus a very small Ottoman air force. Okay, so uh, here's just a quick breakup of the 5th Army. So 3 Corps, which was on the peninsula, 5, 7 and 9 Division, and 19th Division, which was the reserve. So the 9th Division were the ones who actually had the sentries on the coast when, uh, when our people landed in the dark, right? And the 19th Division, which was commanded by, at that time, Mustafa Kamal Bay, um, the 19th Division based out of Bogali uh, was commanded by Kamal and some of those, you recognise some of those regiments there, the 57th in particular. Okay, and these two divisions were on the Chanakali side and fortified command was the uh, coastal artillery. So this um, Esad Pasha, he was the senior Ottoman commander on the peninsula. And he, his boss was uh, Lehman von Sanders. Um, now it's uh, he, a very experienced um, and well in military educated officer. Um, and he'd, um, he'd been in, in the Ottoman army since 1884 and was a graduate of the Prussian War Academy. Um, commanded a corps in Greece and 
he was very well organised. His his corps, third corps, was the only Ottoman army corps that met its reactivation and um, uh, mobilisation schedule. Very very good. Okay, so he planned the defence of the, the peninsula. Now I'll show you here. He's wearing this is obviously a post. 1915, he's wearing the German Iron Cross, and also this medal here, which is called the Ottoman War Medal. So there's one of them here from my collection, if you want to come up and have a look. It is not, ladies and gentlemen, it is not a Gallipoli star, okay? If you see these advertised on eBay, they are not Gallipoli stars, because unscrupulous sellers are trying to make a buck from the word Gallipoli. And we'll have a look at that. So that particular award was uh, awarded for um, uh, all campaigns across the war, not just for the Where was the Third Corp? There we go. Um, and so there's uh, Ninth Division was spread down here, and the 19th Division commanded by Kamal Bay was back here with his headquarters at Bagali. Who's been to the little little town of Bagali and seen the headquarters there? Yeah, yeah, there's a there's a building in the middle of a little village that is a museum to uh, to Kamal's headquarters. And there was a uh, 15 core on the other side. Okay. Just to show you um, you know who was who was opposing who in that initial area. There's our man, Mustafa Kamal. Alright. Um, so he served in the military from 1893 to 1920. He was a member of the CUP, but he was in fact in favour of neutrality. He was one of the uh, key officers in the CUP who was not in favour of coming down on the side of the Germans and Austro-Hungarians. He fought in the Balkan Wars, um, he'd been a military attaché, he fought at Gallipoli, the Caucasus, and then uh, the Sinai and Palestine campaigns. And, um, and he resigned in 1920, but what happened in 1920 onwards is, of course, another story it's from the War of the Independence. Um, and here he is wearing the purple collar patch, which showed that he had done. Uh, senior officer's qualification. So you could be a, a lieutenant colonel or a colonel and you could command a corps level. Okay, uh, so at Gallipoli he was um, commander of 19th Division and he was uh, key in stopping the inland advance. And unfortunately it's been my experience as a guy um, let's be delicate and say Australia has a lack of knowledge where the only officer on the peninsula was Kamal, right? And you try and convince people that there was a whole Ottoman army corps on the peninsula and they don't want to know. There was only one Turkish officer and here he is. It's, it's very disappointing sometimes, I can tell you. <laughs> All right, who was the better soldier? Just as a matter, let's end the argument. <laughs> we might talk about this at the end. So there were several advantages to being an Ottoman. So you fighting on your home soil, plus the 19th Division had just conducted an exercise, a training exercise on that very ground. Three quarters of them were tough and battle hardened from the Balkans. The leadership was combat ready in general terms, but certainly, certainly their senior staff were very, very experienced. They had shorter lines of supply, they, had, they were able to get fresh food and wood, particularly fresh vegetables. And the big factor against uh, our side was that the Allied High Command underestimated the determination and skill of the Ottomans. And our boys were described as enthusiastic amateurs. So I'll have a thousand words from each of you before we leave at the end of the day. <laughs> there we go. Now, casualties. Casualties. As I mentioned, not just the army, but the whole empire 
the whole empire was meticulous in keeping records. Um, and military losses um, were <coughs> generally, generally speaking, right up until say the last six months of World War One, were very, very accurate. So there's the casualty figures for the one. 100, 170, almost 175,000, that's all categories. Okay. How long can you keep this up? How long can you keep that up? All right, let's have a look at a, another expeditionary force. Uh, Galicia in 1617, it's not Galicia in Spain. Um, this is the area just to the east of the Hungarian border where that circle is there. Um, it, again, to fight off the Russians. And uh, initially, in 1916, General Brusilov made um, some significant gains. Um, and the Ottomans rushed uh, an expeditionary force into that area to help their allies, uh, the Austro-Hungarians. So that's the area <coughs> um, of where they're fighting on the eastern boundary of Hungary. And you'll notice those Ottoman troops there are wearing steel helmets and they've all got binoculars uh, very well equipped because the Austro-Hungarians gave them their equipment. All right, so that was, it was 15 core. Um, so just over 12 months and core size varied between 27 and 32. Uh, Sevat Pasha was the, uh, was the commander and he was, uh, they were so successful that the Kaiser, Wilhelm, invited Sevat Pasha to Berlin to you know, have morning tea with him, etc. He was very impressed. So the two main divisions that made up that force were the 19th and 20th from the Italy. And then they later redeployed the Palestine. Again, the casualties, the casualties. From 1916, there were 15,000 casualties. The total casualties, uh, including the 1917 figures, were 25,000. 25,000 men killed, wounded, or taken prisoner, or died of disease, um, which is not good. Okay, so here's the Ottoman War Medal. I mentioned that before, um, and you can come up and have a look at one there. Now, I put this, this in here because this is one of the few positive things that our Sultan, Mehmet V, did sitting in his palace. He, uh, first of all, he declared jihad. Then he um, uh, authorised the manufacture and award of this particular medal, which was available to all ranks and it was also available to all ranks of Germans or Austro-Hungarians who, uh, who came to support the empire. Um, and so those who were sent as advisors. Um, and it was, it's worn, you'll see in the photographs, it's worn down here on the right, mm, not right breast, right stomach. And the ribbon, which is red and white, goes through the tunic buttonhole. And you'll see that on uh, a lot of, there it is there. So there's, uh, there's the Sultan's. And that's the Sultan's cipher with the date in Arabic numerals. And there's some of the uh, campaigns that it was awarded for. So if you see that, it's a very interesting uh, award. But it is not, ladies and gentlemen, it is not a delivery star, which you'll see. Okay, let's move on. Let's have a look at the Ottoman Navy. Um, the CUP decided to upgrade the, the Navy and um, they, because they, they, their fleet was very old, they ordered ships to be built in the United Kingdom. Okay, so they had an ongoing relationship with the, with the UK. They wanted two dreadnoughts, two cruisers and four destroyers. But our man Churchill, or their man in church, yeah. cancelled these. <sighs> Sorry, can't have your ships anymore. We want them. So the Ottomans were not happy about this. This is an, probably a, the second most important reason why the Ottomans sided with the Central Powers, okay? because Churchill took their ships away 
which they wanted to use to fight the Russians. Um, so who's the villain of the piece? Well, that's, that's a good argument. Might have later. Um, there's the strength, um, and two German ships, which I'll show you in a moment, um, came under command. So they had uh, about one battle cruiser, two battleships, and a lot of other small bits and pieces, many of which were very old. The important ones, the small ones, are down the bottom there that were the mine layers. Um, and they didn't capture the French submarine. Let's just have a quick look at the two German ships who uh, quite conveniently were fleeing the British fleet in the eastern end of the Mediterranean. So the only place they had to go was to Constantinople, to drive up through the Dardanelles, and then they said, oh, goodness me, we'll hand over the ships and the crews to the Ottoman Navy. So one day they were German ships, and the next morning there's a great set of photographs, if you see them, of the crews plus Ottoman sailors, all lined up on the decks of the ship wearing red feathers. Um, so the, the Gerben, was called the Yarbasudden Selim, and the uh, cruiser, the Breslau, was called the Nadir in the Turkish, in the Ottoman Navy. Uh, this, of course, is probably the most famous vessel in the Ottoman Navy, the Nusrat, who, uh, who laid the string of mines um, and was involved in sinking of the Bouvet, the Irresistible, the Ocean, and damaged all those others. Um, Although the gold has got a uh, shell below. So there are three, now there are three, this is, this is an enduring theme in Turkey at the moment. Mine is bigger than yours. My <laughs> monuments are all bigger than yours. So they've got the original ship, which has been recovered from a wreck. It's in the port of Tarsus. There's a museum uh, replica at Chinakale. Some of you have probably seen it. And then now, there's actually a working reproduction which does cruises, a bit like a manly ferry up and down uh, the Chamakai area. Uh, there it is there. It was uh, fairly new in 1913. And it laid that string of mines, which I'll show you in a second. Um, so that's it there. The deadliest warship in the Ottoman Navy. All right. Um, the Ottoman Air Force, believe it or not. Here we go. First Ottoman pilot was Captain Faisal, and then eight others trained in France. So, ongoing. <coughs> uh, and there were various planes used during the Balkan Wars. Um, there's Captain Faisal, there's the uh, Ottoman Army flying wings, and uh, a different pilot. And uh, here's a picture of some of the Planes that were used throughout the First World War. Faults, Rumblesh, and Newport. And they've got the, uh, this is their marking, uh, a black square with a white, white border around it. Okay. Um, there was a squadron at the Dardanelles. There was, uh, there was only four planes, commanded by a German. And they, they dropped a, uh, a bomb on it, the Vestic. So this one was capable of uh, landing on the water as well. So they're developing their air, air capability. All right, women in the Ottoman services, believe it or not. Here we go. Medical staff included male and female doctors, nurses, and orderlies from both Muslim and non Muslim faiths. Um, so there we go, Greek Orthodox, Syrian Christians, etc., etc. And the only difference between the female nurses was the style of hairdress. And then I discovered um, only the other day that because of all these ongoing losses of men, you know, manpower losses, they formed uh, female labour battalions um, to support the logistics chain. I've had no much more than that. Okay, three. Victories, if you like, for the Ottomans. Chernobyl campaign, of course. Uh, the siege of Kut, where the 6th Indian Division was besieged and captured. Um, and 11,000 men went into captivity. And this one here is 
quite interesting, uh, the sinking of the HMS Ben Macri, which was a seaplane carrier. So this was the sinking of the very first aircraft carrier by German artillery, land artillery, a 75 millimeter Krupp gun. Uh, first of all, there's the, there's the map I promised you, and there is the single belt of mines that the Nusrat um, laid in the Dardanelles, uh, which caught all those ships, and they didn't know that that belt of mines was there. Um, surrender at al -Kut. Um Now, Townsend was very heavily criticised because he was living in luxury as a prisoner of war, and his men were living in squalor and filth, and many of them died. So, not a very good record there. Um, and there's the Turkish staff of the um, uh, of Khalil Pasha and his staff who captured that division at Kut. Uh, here's the Ben Macri um, converted so that you could have your aircraft inside this, uh, this shed, if you like, at the back. This hangar. And uh, the, um, it was close enough to Turkish land artillery to put a couple of shells below the water line. Luckily, when it sank, it only went down two metres. But the mascot, golden mascot cat was saved. So. And, and it was later reflated. So they, the Ottomans classified that as a victory. Now, propaganda. Hmm. Uh, we're going to have a look at a, a few little bit, bits of propaganda. It's how the, uh, the central powers advertise themselves using the social media of the day. Um, and there we go, the, the common themes were the greatness of the national leaders, brothers in arms, strategic objectives. And small children in the nursery with their toys. I think I've got that one there. Uh, now, before we look at the postcards, uh, this one is interesting. It's not a postcard. The Kaiser visited the Caliph or the Sultan, in 1917 to prop up the Ottoman. And here's the Kaiser wearing the uniform of a field marshal in the Ottoman army. Now I ask you ladies and gentlemen, who wanders around Europe handing out knighthoods and medals to people who don't really need them? Such a thing would never... Oh. Don't you have it? <laughs> <laughs> Handing out bombs to people who don't really need them. So there's, there's the Kaiser in Field Marshal of the Ottoman Empire. Wonderful stuff. All the gongs and the game. All right. Postcards, social media of the day. Um, Willem II of Germany, Mehmed V in the Ottoman Empire, and Francis Joseph. Uh, here's the kiddies in the nursery building the Berlin to Baghdad Railway. Wonderful stuff. Now, this is an interesting one. Um, I only found this the other day and put it in. The Brothers in Arms. So, Turkish troops, note that word Turkish is used by the Germans in Galicia. Um, and this is, a, this is definitely um, Brothers in Arms. Well, German's not that good, but that's essentially what it means. And there's another one, soldiers of the uh, of the central powers, postcards. Now, back to the sort of more serious stuff. What were the casualties during World War One? So, the Ottomans mobilised 2.85 million men in nine armies, three independent corps, and a number of independent units. There are their casualties for World War I. 175,000 killed in action. Wounded, 763,000. Right? 104.4 million casualties total. And 3 million civilians. And I'll mention this. And where did those figures come from? Uh, international cycling so, so of World War I. Massive numbers of casualties. What did it achieve?
Now, what happened to the three Parshas? What happened to the three Parshas? End of a Parsha, the guy who loved all the medals and the uniforms and sashes. He, uh, he went to Russia, believe it or not, and fought with the white forces. It's almost ironic, isn't it? You know, here's, you know, you're declaring war against the Russians because you hate them so much, and then you end up, you know, your empire collapses, so you, you go across to the Russians. Uh, he was um, he was killed uh, in Tajikistan in, a, in an action of Red Army Cavalry in 1922. Jamal, um, another officer, another serving officer, he fled to Germany and again was, uh, I don't know the, the details, he was assassinated in Tbilisi uh, in 1922 by survivors of the Armenian massacres. And Talat Pasha, perhaps most hated Ottoman of all, was assassinated in Berlin in 1921 by a survivor. You know, this almost goes without saying, many of the problems we see in the Middle East today arise directly or indirectly from things that happened back then. Now here's another interesting bit. Um, 1923, when they got it, there was a government, there was an Ottoman government after the collapse of the empire in October 1919. Uh, and it had to deal with the victorious Allied powers. Um, and these uh, treaty negotiations went on for several years. Um, and so there's a whole list of countries there whose borders were determined by not just the Treaty of Lausanne, but I'm using that one as the main one. Now remember the Kurds, you, this is, again, this is an ongoing problem today. Kurdish self-determination was declined by the Allies back then, in the early 1920s. It was declined by the Allies. They remain a nation, a Kurdish nation, but they are not a nation state. Not a nation state. And we still have that problem. This is the big one, ladies and gentlemen. This is the big one. There was an amnesty declared against those Ottomans who were perpetrators of the uh, Armenian massacre. And as I was researching this, there are also pogroms against Greek, Greek Orthodox people who were part of the empire and also in Syria. And anyone that was involved in uh, those ethnic cleansing activities was granted an amnesty. And that is a really big one. I mean, Joe Biden only made a statement about this the other day, last week. This is an ongoing fester of sword give it its proper. Um, so here we are today. Ah, here's modern Turkey. And that's why I put the word Anatolian in an earlier slide right at the very front. This area was previously known as Anatolia. Okay, and that's what modern Turkey looks like now. And Mustafa Kemal moved the, uh, the capital, the government capital, from away from Istanbul, Constantinople, whatever you want to call it, up to Ankara, um, where it remains today. I was privileged enough to get in there a few years ago, a very nice city. That's what that looks like. Now, some modern stuff before we throw it out for questions. We've still got a few minutes. Here's the uh, Chernobyl Martyrs Memorial at Morto Bay, where mainly where the French were. Uh, 253,000. Turks participated in that campaign. Now, as I said, my, you know, the Turks are really good at this. My monument is bigger than yours. Uh, this is, what, 42 metres high. You can see it from out at sea. It's enormous. You can see there's, there's some, uh, some people there at the bottom. It is absolutely enormous, along with all the other memorials on that particular site. Also, uh, monuments on Gallipoli, for instance, there's the 57th Regiment. Um, and, you know, uh, we and the New Zealanders and the Brits, etc., etc., have our Anzac Day ceremonies. Well, the Turks had one at the same time. So you just shift from ceremony to ceremony. You work your way up the hill. This one's 
Um, so this one occurs before the New Zealand um, memorial services at Chumak Valley. Then you just work your way up the hill. And every time I go there, the Turks have erected a newer and bigger memorial. Um, there's this one here. This one's just across from, uh, from the 57th Regiment, just showing a Turkish soldier with his mouths are there. This one here, the one on the other side, it is a myth, right? It's supposed to be um, an Ottoman soldier carrying a, an ally casualty. Mm, bit dubious, <laughs> bit dubious. And of course, at the top, at uh, Chung Bae, there's a giant statue of Mustafa Kemal near the New Zealand Memorial. Now, I'm going to disappoint a lot of you. I'll go out on Lynn here, I'll bring this particular memorial to your attention. Everyone knows these wonderful words, these heroes that shed their blood, uh, now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Garbage. Total and utter garbage. A recent speech, I'm um, sorry, it's supposed to be a speech by Mustafa Kemal, then a pasha, in 1928. But some very, very detailed and forensic analysis has revealed that he, none of his staff, none of his political staff, none of his military staff, none of his aides, nobody ever spoke these words. Never, ever, ever. But yet we've got this massive memorial just above the beach at Ari Burnu, and it's just been refurbished. It's just been refurbished, and in the top corner is Ataturk, his, his face. So, what do we do, ladies and gentlemen? This is very embarrassing. We've just discovered that you know, one of the tenets of the Anzac legend is completely false. What do we do? We swallow our pride and say, hmm, okay, um, it's got admirable sentiments, so we'll just leave it where it is. So I'll leave you to form your own opinions about that. I just offer you this. I suspect that maybe, if, even if it's got admirable sentiments in it, maybe they should remove Mustafa's or Kamal's face from the memorial. He never said those words. We might agree with them. They might be all ring true, but they're not his words, which is most unfortunate. Okay, now uh, we haven't got a, um, an internet connection here. I was going to show you the Janissary Band, which is at the Military Museum in Istanbul. Wonderful music. Um, you can pull that up on YouTube if you want. Um, the uh, National War Museum, they, they do almost daily performances. And they're dressed, yeah, these are the musicians um, in the red and blue robes. And then you've got the Janissaries that look at that very strange looking hat with a big flap on the back. And then they've got the armor plated warriors and they all turn up. And they're the staff of the Turkish War College, which is next door, and they do this most afternoons. Now, in case you're interested in participating in this, you must have a big black moustache. <laughs> if you haven't got a big black moustache, you don't get a job in the bag. I was told that by one of my Turkish colleagues. You must have a big, big moustache, but you don't get a job. So you can pull those up. All right, that's it. Um, we, we've been, you know, 10 years of total chaos in just under an hour. Questions, questions. Yes. Admiral Wimper is the British naval person that flipped the Turks up the 94, but that was basically instructing them in mine warfare and <coughs> torpedo work. Yes. Did the British really cut their own throat with him? Yes. Yes. <laughs> All the Ottoman officers who attended um, senior officer development courses in the United Kingdom, in France, in Prussia, in Germany, in Hungary, yeah, so, you know, there were, right up until the very end, or, or that secret agreement, there was a lot of um, uh, liaison with European 
governments going on, um, but Enver Pasha and his mates decided, no, nope, we've got to go with the central powers. Yeah. Any more questions? <coughs> yes, Ron. David, um, Pardon me for drinking one. No, you mentioned uh, uh, the why we only know about Kamal as the only commander on uh, Gallipoli and particularly yeah. at the time of the land. And a part of that is that Kamal later on very carefully airbrushed everyone out. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and it's interesting now that uh, Erdogan, the president of Turkey, is trying to airbrush Kamal out. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and when I was there in 2019, there's all these posters hanging out of windows everywhere of Kamal. Yeah. And I asked why, and they said, every time Erdogan does something we don't like, out come all the yeah. posters. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should have worn my, um, my Ataturk tie. I've got a tie with Ataturk, which was presented to me by a, a Turkish guy, a battlefield guy. The, the other one I'll tell you, this is what's disappointing about being a battlefield guy, and I'm sure Ron has encountered this sort of grief before. I had a guy on a tour of Gallipoli, and he told me, and he told the bus, there's always one in every bus, <laughs> that there was only one donkey on Gallipoli, and we came first because we had the donkey and the Turks didn't. Right? That was his, his... And I said, where are you... And that was one of them, several garbage statements he made to people in the bus and I had to correct him every time. And, and I'll, again, I'll go out on a limb. I said, where are you getting this information? He said, oh, we talk about this at the front bar of my RSL club. Mm -hmm. And I thought, my God, you know, RSL club, really big repository of military history accuracy. I'm, I'm, I really do despair sometimes about how ignorance is too strong a word, but lack of knowledge is... Uh, it's disappointing sometimes. Very disappointing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What, uh, what happened to the uh, Turkish fear and obviously at the end of the Gallipoli campaign? What, what, um, were they uh, they, uh, somewhere else or were they handed back to the Turks? Uh, they were handed back at the end of the war, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. Where were they moved off to somewhere else? Uh, uh, those that were captured were first taken to the island of Imbros yeah. and then back to Egypt. And then they were repatriated afterwards. Yeah. Question down the back there. Well, yeah, look, it was in the 1880s and 90s that the Turks and the Russians had significant yes. campaigns against each other. So I always got the impression that the Turks focused on the Russians more than they did on the actual Italy and the Sinai. So if you talk about what percentages of troops were on the, I guess, on the Caucasus front against the Russians versus against um, Sinai and Gallipoli. So yeah. They had the Russian front, I think they were about shed loads of the troops to fall into the other fronts. Yeah, um, I, I haven't got any percentages. The, the figures I showed you there were the ones that went to uh, Galicia and to the Caucasus. But they, they had far more troops in the Middle East, you know, down in the Middle East, and to fight those campaigns. And also they were uh, defending their own borders around the, the Black Sea area. So I, I can't give you percentages. But there was a big fear. The, the focus of their, <clears throat> uh, their Ottoman um, countermeasures were, was going to be based on their navy you know, to patrol the Black Sea and keep the Russians bottled up. But one last question. Yeah. Oh, it's just, a, I guess, a, a point of information. You know, you mentioned the Janissaries band. Mm. Um, I'm aware that the Janissaries, as a group, were an elite unit uh, in the 1600s. Yes. Um, and they were actually um, Christian boys who were converted yep. and uh, they went through a Spartan style of training. Did that, did that actually, in the modern army, the, the time of the World War One, was there a Janissary unit? Or no. no they, that disappeared. No, they disappeared. If you, if you read the history of them, they, they, uh, they rose up against one of the sultans and yeah. Oh, he wiped them out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But they kept the name. Interesting. Yeah, oh, well, it's, it's, it's part of the history. Part of the history, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Oh, sorry, one more. Have we got time? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just, 
So an, an empire 600 years old yes. collapsed in the space of... It had actually been collapsing for at least 150 years before as bits yes, fell bits off. Fell off right. As people in some of those satellite areas said, uh, you know, we, we don't want you anymore. Yeah, we don't want you anymore. For instance, Egypt. Egypt had been a part of the um, Ottoman Empire, but in, I think it was the uh, 1890s, the, the British came in and took it over as a protectorate to stop a, a martyrist uprising. So, There's also a lot of division amongst that yeah. Muslim groups. So that, that in itself is an implosion mm. within the Muslim faith. So a lot of other groups in Egypt and uh, the Arabian Peninsula, mm. so they lost, they lost a lot of internal support. Mm. And that had an impact on those outer areas of the Ottoman Empire as well. Okay, we've run uh, five minutes or so over time. Um, well, can I just, uh, on behalf of the group, David, uh, just like to thank you for a very comprehensive overview of the Ottoman uh, collapse. <laughs> and uh, I know I picked up a, a few different uh, points there that I hadn't ever seen before. So I'd like to thank you and put our hands together for David. Thank you very much. While we're still here, we'll just do a raffle. So I'm just going to pick it. Dave, can I ask for all the tickets out? So we've got.